Okay, so um, Linux is the wild, so I'm Luke, I am Luke Smith. Um, uh, oh, I should stand behind the mic, shouldn't I? Um, so my presentation is entitled Linux is the Wild West, which of course was decided one, the, the night of the application uh, being due for this conference and just sort of came to my head. Uh, it was only after that that I realized that Linux Fest generously gives an entire hour to talk about whatever I want. Um, so I'm going to talk about Linux. I want to talk specifically about minimalist software, uh, why it's, I guess, important for Linux, but not so much in itself. Uh, but at, sort of as a greater, it, there's a more general point that I want to make uh, that's sort of about the nature of decentrality, decentralism in, in design features uh, and other things that's relevant to my own work. So um, if you don't know me, um, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not any kind of IT person. Uh, I actually am a doctoral candidate in linguistics. Uh, so actually, who knows me? Who knows who I am? Oh, okay, all right. All these people who were awkwardly walking by me and didn't say hello, uh, but hello, everyone. Um, so I run a YouTube channel. Uh, maybe I'll talk about that in a second, but uh, it doesn't really matter. So anyway, uh, and I will say there's an alternate title to this, and that is The Future is Decentralized, but I thought that sounded a little too much like a TED Talk, so um, I'm just <laughs> going to skip that. Um, so anyway, there's this traditional uh, dichotomy that people in the, the free software movement have had, and that is between free software and proprietary software. Uh, and, or, you know, of course, when I say free software, I mean it in the FSF sense, you know, free, libre, open source, you know, distributable, visible code um, against proprietary software. So this is traditionally how Linux users have sort of defined, uh, you know, what they do as opposed to what Microsoft or Apple or something like that uh, does. And that sort of defines the identity of people in a lot of ways. Um, and don't, don't get me wrong, I like free software. I'm a big fan of it. I have, you know, two Libra booted ThinkPads, and I always support using free software when you can. But I don't actually think that's the most important issue or the, really the defining feature uh, of Linux as we know it. And of course, I'm not talking about the kernel. I'm talking about the general environment of Linux as an aggregation of a bunch of different tools. Um, and that is, I really think what, what is the important thing in Linux is uh, minimalist software versus bloat. I don't know what to call the opposite of minimalist software that doesn't sound bad. Uh, maybe enterprise, big programs that have a lot of features uh, that try and do a lot of things. Um, and I think that's really, uh, at the core of it, that's more or less the, the important thing that distinguishes Linux from, uh, or not just Linux, but Linux and the you know, BSD, that whole world of, of software from everything else. Um, so, uh, one, one example, this is actually something uh, relevant to my own work. Oh, why am I still wearing this if we're not using the... Um, so this is Herbert Simon. Who knows Herbert Simon? That's exactly how many people I was expecting. So Herbert Simon um, was, it's hard to describe him. We can think of him as being an, an economist or something. But he worked on something like you could, be, you could call cyber, cybernetics, okay? Uh, the study of systems and stuff like that. And he has a very, very nice parable in one of his works. And it's called uh, The Parable of the Watchmakers, um, which I have a nice watch here that you can look at. Um, so the parable of the watchmakers goes like this. So there are two different watchmakers. One of them he calls hora, which is the Latin word for hour. One of, us, one of which he calls tempus, which is the Latin word for time. It doesn't matter their names. Uh, but the idea is, you know, uh, tempus, you know, his idea for constructing watches is, so there are a hundred pieces that go into a watch, and he wants to minimize the amount of steps in that process. So he takes the hundred pieces and he sort of fits them together into one big watch all at once. You know, he sort of clutches it in his hand and, you know, you know finagles it around. Uh, and that's his way of constructing watches. On the other hand, the other guy, Hora, uh, his, his idea is basically that, that's too difficult of a, an operation. What I want to actually do is build, you know, make watches sort of from the bottom up. That is, take the 100 pieces, make a subcomponent of 10 pieces, another subcomponent of 10 more pieces, et cetera, et cetera. So you have smaller pieces that go together to make this one whole. Um, so, you know, uh, Simon's, uh, you know, his, his whole point of using this is there's a sense in which uh, the more decentralized model, when you're building watches from subcomponents, this is actually a much better way of organizing, you know, your life or business. Uh, and if you think about it this way, so if you're building a watch with 100 pieces all at once, and you hear a knock at the door and you have to leave it, all your progress is gone. Uh, whereas if you build subcomponents, those are all entities in themselves. If new technology comes, you have to replace pieces or something like that. 
Uh, you're in this, you can easily replace them if you build some components, but not if you have you know, a bunch of stuff all fitting together at once. So this is the general idea of it, and it's one of the, the foundational ideas in cybernetics, uh, and that is decentralization, right? So here's an image from the first page of Google Images or whatever. Uh, centralization, of course, is everything going together at once, everything being operated by you know, one, one sort of core, whereas decentralization is subcomponents that work together. Now at the surface, decentralization is a little more complicated. Uh, in that you have more nodes and stuff like that, but it's actually it's actually uh, in this sense it's a lot more uh, useful. Um, so we're all we I guess most people are familiar with the, you know the cathedral and the bazaar. You guys know know this most people. Okay, so the distinction of course is um, uh, between uh, software like in, in Microsoft or something like that uh, is usually designed as if if a cathedral is working on it, a whole bunch of people sort of have a set idea, they go through it, um, as opposed to a bizarre type construction where everyone's, it's all, it's a total shit show, everyone's doing different things, everyone is sort of working together to make, uh, you know, different, uh, yeah. By the way, I think initially your agreement was contrasting how the FSA was doing things with the FBI, and you were Right, right. I, but it, it applies at different scales, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the, the, but the point general is, is what I'm getting at here in that, uh, so you have, you, th there's a kind of construction which is not necessarily even organized by a central authority but comes sort of from the, the bottom up. Um, oh, there's an illustration, but we can skip over it. So my idea here uh, is basically what, what defines Linux isn't necessarily that it's free software. That is a, an important component of it that sort of ties into this. Um, but it, the programs are small and predictable. When you have bugs, since those bugs are in sm small subcomponents, you can easily figure out where they're coming from. Uh, and the system is decomposable. You can take a piece out, do something with it, do something else, replace it. Uh, and you know there are other benefits. It's light on resources. It's easy to maintain, stuff like this. Um, so I'm a big proponent of this kind of, of minimalist uh, view of, of software. Uh, and you might be familiar with the Unix philosophy, which sort of ties into the same thing, right? Uh, programs should do one thing and do them well. Uh, and if you have a program that's doing something a little, you know, a little more advanced than that, it, it gets a little confusing. And um, but um, um, so, a lot of people will come to Linux nowadays. A lot of people want to, you know, be Linux evangelist. Now, I'm not, I'm not actually a big Linux evangelist, but. Um, I'm, I'm, I've always had the perspective of letting them uh, judge you by your fruits, so to speak. Show what you can do on Linux, don't necessarily throw it in people's faces. But, uh, you know, I will say one, one idea that I think a lot of people have when they're dealing with how do we make Linux accessible to other people uh, is, you know, we, we sh what sh we should really be shooting for is making one cohesive environment, like one Linux, like may maybe even like one set desktop environment or something like this. Um, or, but really one big thing that is Linux that is a brand that we can market and that's one thing that makes, and everyone's doing sort of the same thing on it. Uh, now I, I'm very much opposed to this. Uh, first off, there's the problem that we already have that and it's called Windows or Mac OS in the sense that we, it's sort of hard to uh, compete with something that's basically the same thing and already established. Um, so in uh, you know, originally I, I actually, uh, I got my undergrad in economics, uh, one, I, and I worked on game theory and stuff like that, which I actually still do. So game theory is just the analysis of strategic behavior or something like that. Uh, and one common example uh, in it is uh, sailing. So there, you of course can have these sailing races. Uh, and the interesting thing about sailing races, let's say there are two people in a sailing race. Uh, you can tack left and right uh, to go for, you know, to sort of catch the wind and go in certain directions. Uh, and, uh, you know, basically you, your strategy works out in this way. So if you're the leader, what you want to do is sort of predict what the person behind you is doing. So if you go right, he goes right. Uh, that way, if you run into some turbulence, he does too. Uh, or vice versa. So he can't get ahead, ahead of you if you always make the same decisions. Uh, on the other side, if you're behind, the, the person who's behind in the race always wants to make decisions that are different from the person in the lead. Because if they always make the same decisions, they're always going to catch the same waves, they're always going to get the same wind. Uh, and I think the, the same thing is true of Linux. Like a lot of people have this idea that uh, competing with Mac OS or something like that, or competing with Windows is an issue of uh, making similar design decisions that they've made in the past. And I, I, th I think that's uh, not incredibly right. The, now, the, of course, that makes uh, that some users are attracted to easy to use features, but I think the important thing is actually making Linux uh, distinct. 
uh, from these. Um, so a bad idea would make, uh, be making a Windows or Mac clone or something like that. Uh, I'm not, I'll explain this in a bit. But my, my idea is basically leave the chaos in place, leave these small decentralized pro programs, let them be there, uh, but give new users tools to like make sense of it, make it easy for them to do that. Because you might have a chaotic world, but if people have the res resources for you know, you know, uh, navigating the chaotic world, that's a good thing. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, how do we do this? Um, so, uh, well, I don't know how to, do, I, I don't have like some authoritarian idea of like what exactly we should do, but I'll tell you what I do. Um, so those of you who I guess know me from the internet know that I have like a YouTube channel and it's usually noted because I have these like colorful thumbnails with like memes on them that, that aren't related to any of the content on the channel or something. It's just sort of a joke. Um, so my thing, I actually started using Linux, I guess, um, three years ago or something like that. Um, and really just when uh, Windows 10 came out. Um, and my perspective then was just, I am j I'm going to start putting up videos on YouTube, but it's just going to be things that I happen to be doing today. Uh, or, you know, silly stuff like that. Um, and, you know, you make a bunch of thumbnails and people start watching. Um, and m my objective has always been making uh, just little tutorials that are, you know, maybe five, seven minutes that show you exactly how to do something, not droning on about how I feel about Linux or something like that. That's what Linux Fest is for. Um, but anyway, <laughs> Uh, so I, another thing that I really like um, that I think bridges the gap. So in addition, I think that uh, one of the things uh, that I think is important to remember is the software is out there. Uh, it's just an issue of making it sort of accessible to new users. Um, so I, li I like making tutorials. And the other thing I like is wizards. Um, I'm, n I'm not actually, uh, I don't think of myself as being a computer programmer. I don't really write programs. But I do, what I do like is wizards. I love wizards. They're fantastic. Because the thing is, if you create a, a wizard for you know, putting software together, you're not adding more onto the stockpile of all the stuff we have, but you're making that stockpile easier to navigate. And that's what I'm a big fan of. Um, so one, one issue that I had when I, I started using, so well I should say if you don't know my channel, I don't just use Linux, um, I use basically a very highly configured setup with using a tiling window manager, i3 gaps, uh, I use basically all terminal programs besides my browser and stuff like that. I, I don't use like the TTY, I use it in a graphical environment in i3. Um, and my, my objective is pretty much using keyboard um, programs that are easily accessible by the keyboard, don't really use the mouse, and basically uh, minimizing the time that I use, uh, you know, the number of key presses it takes for me to do something. That's basically my idea. So one program that I ran across uh, sort of getting into this was MUT. Uh, anyone know what MUT is? Anyone know? Okay, oh, most people, great. Uh, more people than Herbert Simon, of course. Um, so uh, MUT, MUT is a, actually a really fantastic program. It's a, an email uh, client. Um, and the thing about MUT, it is, it is a huge pain to get working. Uh, it is, um, uh, it's on a, uh, well, actually, who, who uses MUT? Okay, wow, look at that. There's like <laughs> at least two and a half people. That, that's, well, I do too, so I should put my hand up too. I love MUT, it's fantastic. Uh, but if you've, well, uh, actually, well, let me ask this. Who's tried to use MUT? Okay, okay, more people, okay. So <laughs> that makes sense. Um, so MUT is one of those program programs that's fantastic. I really like it, but it, it, it takes so much effort to, that you have to pour in to, to get it working. And after that, I sort of had the idea, actually, what's, oh yeah, well, here's what it looks like, but you can't really see anything there. Um, so what I ended up doing is, you know, it basically took me a year to get MUT configured the way I wanted. Um, and that's relatively typical. Uh, but I realized after I was done with this, I could basically list out all the stuff I did, like all the stuff that, you know, you actually need to go through. Now, I, I don't just mean MUT configured. I wanted offline email. I wanted my passwords to be automatically accessible uh, and encrypted, so not just any person could see them. Um, I wanted uh, indexing, I wanted all this stuff, all of these mi moving pieces working together. And that's what took so long to, to actually, it, uh, configuring MUD itself doesn't take too long, but getting it working with all these pieces is a huge pain. Um, so what I end up do doing is actually writing a wizard for this, like literally, and it took literally just like one weekend. Um, so what this wizard does, it's just an in curses uh, menu, and it's not just for MUT. Um, so what it does is, uh, you, all you do is go to it, 
you give it your uh, email address um, and it will auto detect a bunch of information for that, but it'll give you an automatically configured MUD RC. It gives individual RC files for each email account you input it, so you can actually use multiple, uh, you can go through it multiple times and add multiple email addresses. Um, it gives you keyboard shortcuts for jumping between those boxes and accounts in MUT, so you can jump back and forth. So, you know, if I have five e email accounts, um, you know, I1 goes to my first one, I2 goes to my second or something like that. Or you can jump to inboxes and stuff like that. All of that is generated automatically. Uh, and this is actually a huge pain because different email uh, services, of course, have different names for their sent mail or something like that. That's something very user, uh, useful. Um, so also, I have it configured with offline IMAP, which is a fantastic program that will mirror uh, a, um, uh, excuse me, a, an IMAP, uh, the contents of an IMAP uh, uh, email account on your actual computer. So if you actually just configure MUD itself, it has to, you know, you have to be connected to the, e uh, the internet or something like that. And I was like, I don't want to do that. I actually lived a, a year or so, or more than two years without internet, like at my house. So I wanted to have email, you know, I wanted to be able to respond to them at my home. So I wanted something like this. Um, so the, the, the um, wizard does all this, configures MUT, it configures offline IMAT, uh, it encrypts your passwords with GPG, um, and it, you can also set up a cron job so that it checks your email accounts at every so many minutes, uh, and also uses not much to uh, index email. So, yeah. No, well, I would write email at home. So I would, you know, I'd get, usually get a bunch of emails for, from like my YouTube channel. Uh, and then I'd, uh, you know, download them when I'm at work or something like that. And I'd write out my responses at home. So you had internet at work? Yeah, yeah, that's what I use. It's not like I, I didn't live in a cabin totally alone. But, um, and by the way, if any of you guys are thinking about like, if your e uh, internet is about to expire at your home, I am a full proponent of just not having internet at your house. I think it's fantastic. Um, the, it, it's, it's really great. Yeah, everyone who's done it is like, oh man, I'm so free. You realize how much time you have. Uh, <laughs> yes, he says no, but. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, yes? Cell phone. Cell phone, oh, I hate those things too. The only reason I have a cell phone, <laughs> only reason I have a cell phone is because, you know, my parents still pay for it. So, you know, whatever, I have to have it. They'll complain if I don't, but. Um, yeah, I think cell phones are the same, like, um, yeah, realistically, I'm going to just have a landline when I have that ability. I hate those things, but I really just never use my cell phone. Uh, I could. Well, I will say I basically just keep my cell phone at my house all times. Like, I happen to, I happen to, oh, I didn't think that's funny. I thought a lot of people did that. I don't know. I, I, I hate, I hate phones so much. It's, it's terrible. And you know what? Uh, okay. This is not relevant to my original talk. Oh, I got, pl okay, never mind. I have plenty of time, so I'll tell this. So one funny thing, it's, it's, it's the state of our society. Um, oh, God, I hope my dad isn't watching this, but he might eventually. Um, so one of the things about my dad is, you know, he's, he plays Pokemon Go. You know, what these, you know what these adults nowadays are playing? Like, it's crazy. Like, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, I was, uh, was I, my dad's probably watching this. Hey, dad. Um, but 20 years ago, he used to complain of me playing Pokemon at the dinner table. And now, like, every time we go out, he's playing Pokemon Go, and I don't know. Like, he came out, I, moved, I recently moved um, from Arizona back to Georgia after a while. And it, I, he came out to help me in Arizona, but I secretly suspect it's to get, like, sand slashes and stuff that they don't have. <laughs> like, that's... He was so happy, he's like, wow, I've never seen a Lilith. This is great. Um, so that's, the, that's our society. So yeah, I'm against cell phones, too. Uh, and it's also insane to me that like 10-year-old kids have like cell phones. I don't know how this happens. But anyway, so what was I talking about? Wizards, wizardry. Um, so the thing about, so yeah, so the, what the wizard does is it configures MUT for you, it configures offline IMAP, uh, it indexes your mail so you can easily search it with a keyboard shortcut, it gives you a lot of what I consider sensible defaults, uh, encrypts your password, all this stuff, uh, and on the user side, it just works. That, like, you don't have to know what's going on, um, but it's, it's totally fine, you don't actually have to think about it. Um, uh, you just follow the directions, which actually is sometimes hard for people, but you know, anyway. Um, so this, I, I actually, I've done other stuff, I've done other wizards, but this is the one I like the most, just because it saved me like months and months, well, it didn't save me months and months, but it saved other people months and months of time configuring this program that gives you something really, really sweet 
uh, and it gives you all it gives you all the bells and whistles, and it's something you can do in like literally three minutes. Um, so yeah, and this is what I'm talking about. That is, you don't necessarily need to give people a cohesive environment so long as um, you give them. Uh, you, you help them along the process of configuring them, and of course, all of the moving parts in MUT, offline IMAP, uh, not much, all that stuff, all of them are still available to users. All of them can easily, oh, uh, I want to only sync these particular folders. Uh, so, oh, all I, it's, all I have to do is edit my offline IMAP RC file, and that's it. Um, so it's supposed to be, it's not supposed to make, thing, it's supposed to make installation easy, uh, but it's supposed to make it even easier for you to get further into the configuration. Um, so another thing I, I do that harms me probably is use Arch Linux. Um, now I started using Arch Linux, a call, actually soon after I started using Linux generally. Um, and the nice thing about Arch is, um, it, it actually all the things I don't want to deal with are really easy to do. They're done automatically. Um, but the nice thing is because it forces you to have a minimal install, um, it, you can, you don't have to deal with like you know taking away all that software you don't like when you know you originally install an operating system, and that what that's what pissed me off about every, everything else, I guess. So I used Arch Linux, um, and I went through a period where I had to install it probably about 20 times in a week. That is, you know, a, a hard drive would break, and I'd be like, ah, I should probably install it here, uh, or uh, oh, I have a couple computers, and like I have this terrible. Like, I just have to have everything perfectly synced. I don't know if you guys are like that, but. Um, so I wanted everything to be pretty much running the same thing. And of course, I was still a Linux newbie, so it's like at that situation where, oh, I messed up you know, something minor in my install and I don't know how to fix it, so I'm just gonna reinstall the whole thing. So that's pretty typical. Um, so anyway, what I ended up doing is, time and time again, I would install Arch. I'd install all the programs I wanted via Pac-Man, all the ones I use on a daily basis. I'd have to use, you know, activate all my uh, uh, services and stuff like that, user permissions, all the stuff. Um, and I'd deploy my own dot files, things like Mutt Wizard, stuff like that. Um, and this process, too, got, like, sort of annoying. Like, it's something that I ended up doing time and time again. Um, and so I figured I might as well just automate this. Um, and what actually happens is, you know, a lot of people on YouTube would be like, hey, um, I like how your computer looks. Uh, how do I make my computer look like mine, uh, like yours? And I don't want to tell people, oh, oh, that's easy, just months and months of, like, strain and stress, and you'll get that way. <laughs> but it's actually, that's actually not true at all. It's, it's actually a very fun, uh, it's lots of tinkering, lots of playing around. That's really what it is. But it takes a long time. Um, but it, eventually, the instructionals that I made for YouTube turn into scripts, which turn into really cohesive systems. Uh, and that's when I made what I call uh, LARBs, which is a ridiculous sounding name, so it has a ridiculous logo. Uh, it stands for uh, Luke's Arch Rice Bootstrapping Scripts. It's pronounceable, so I went with it. Um, so the idea behind this is, um, uh, this is really, it's not an Arch install system. It's sort of a way of deploying my configs. Um, that is, it. Uh, basically what it does is you take a fresh install of Arch, uh, it installs the programs that I want, it reads from a CSV file, uh, you know, this is the program I want for this, uh, if I've selected an option, so I'll install this. So it installs all the programs I use at a daily basis, it installs things like Network Manager, Pulse Audio, all the basic things, uh, and then of course it uses my dot files. And uh, since I put this out, I, there are actually hundreds of my users who use this thing, which is actually sort of weird. It's weird. I mean, it's like someone wearing your underwear when someone uses your dot files. I, it's just very strange to me. But people do it, and not just that, the system is actually, you can take it and use it for your own dot files. So you can replace it with your own uh, stuff and, and run with it. Um, so that's it. Uh, where are we on time? Okay, not bad on time. Um, so, oh, was I supposed to read that? Like you should have used Ansible or something. What's that? No, you know. using, like, a, tool. Yeah, well, I always feel like I'll just do it my own way. You know, that's my perspective. Um, there, yeah, yeah, there are a lot of tools that do sort of similar things. I mean, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Like, oh, when I run my website, there are a lot of things that do 99% of what I want, but I'd rather it do 100%. So I'm just going to write it myself. You know, that's you know, just my own thing. Uh, but yeah, um, so the, the goal of it, of course, is not just to make things easy. Um, it does sort of do that, but the goal is to remove the barriers to entry, uh, but leave the customizability to me or whatever other user. So here is a system, here is a working Arch Linux system that looks 
it, well, it looks cool, it has all these programs, but the best thing is here are the config files you can uh, edit to do your own things on it. Um, or, and it also keeps, importantly, it keeps users aware that they're not just using my configuration, they're not using one cohesive system. This is a bunch of little parts to go together and you can change each and every one of these parts. Um, and that, that's, that's sort of the goal in it um, and getting people to actually read the manual. Uh, that's nice, um, which everyone hears that a lot, but it's like actually good advice. Um, uh, so anyway, the, the point is a decentralized and extensible system isn't actually hard, uh, but it can be new to people. Um, like we're not necessarily used to it, but it's something you can overcome, not just you know with instructing people explicitly, but you, you know you can use wizards and stuff like this. And I think a lot of people should focus some of their their. I mean, that's what I do. I like focusing my uh, my effort on sort of making this easier for people who are newer to Linux. Um, so. Anyway, one, one example that I, that I use a lot is, um, you know, Microsoft Word. So, you know, I, like a bunch of other uh, people my age, like, went to school and, of course, learned how to use Microsoft Word. Now, everyone will say things like, well, well, let's put it this way. Um, I think that people think of the, the sort of programs like Word or other what you see is what you get editors as being easy. And they think if I tell you instead, oh, write a document in Pandoc and then use, or excuse me, Markdown and then compile it with Pandoc. Now that sounds complicated. It's actually extremely easy. It takes like literally one command and it's very easy to, to do. Um, but the, there's this sort of veneer of uh, facility or easiness um, in you know, the what you see and is what you get editors. Uh, and that, I, I wanna say that that's really just a historical thing because um, back in the 80s or 90s or whenever it was, I, I guess it was the 90s, uh, you know, the government goes to Microsoft and says, hey, you know what, we wanna teach kids technology. What should we do? And Microsoft, of course, says, oh, how convenient. We just wrote this great program, Microsoft Word. We'll give it to you half price or whatever if you teach it to all your kids. And you know, the rest is history. Um, but one example I use is what, what is actually m a more productive use of time. Now, when I was in first grade, I learned Word. Uh, everything I learned in first grade about Word wasn't true two years later when they changed it. And that, what I learned after that wasn't true after they moved everything around again. Um, but if I had spent my first grade learning something like grep or awk or something like that, uh, that sounds more complicated because we're used to that being, oh, that's the hard stuff, that's the programmer stuff or something like that. But conceptually, it's not necessarily. Like using grep to uh, take, uh, you know, uh, organize a file or, or extract output from a file is something that's actually relatively easy. It can be something useful. Uh, and I, th I think that if we, it's very easy in the same way, I'm not suggesting we all, you know, forcibly uh, uh, teach you know core utilities in school or something like that. I think it might be a good idea. I don't, just don't think it's going to happen. Uh, but I will say it, uh, what I'm trying to say is is, is it's something that's not necessarily difficult. Um, now, uh, I think that Linux as uh, an operating system is actually part of like a more general uh, movement in in different um, uh, affairs. Uh, now, first off, Linux, as I said at the beginning, is, is sort of like a, a decentralized environment. It's not just like one cohesive thing. It's a bunch of programs. There's not really one. There's the Linux kernel, but no one really who actually have, has opinions about the Linux kernel. When you say Linux, you mean ev everything out there. Um, so really, it, it is a weird sort of example of something that's highly decentralized that isn't necessarily winning, but it's going to be here a long time. Uh, and it's something that has sort of gone against the expectations of many people. Um, now, one of my favorite uh, copy pastas that I get, you, some of you guys might have seen this. Uh, this one's actually from um, Adolf Hitler. Um, but this is something you might see around. So are you saying that Linux can run on a computer without Windows underneath it at all? As in, without a boot disk, without any drivers, without any services? That sounds preposterous to me. If that were true, and I doubt it, then companies would be selling your computers without a Windows. This is clearly not happening, so there must be an error in your calculations. I hope you realize that Windows is more than just Office. It's a whole system that runs on the computer from start to finish, and that's a very difficult thing to achieve. A lot of people don't realize this. Microsoft's just spent $9 billion and many years to create Vista, so it doesn't sound reasonable that a new alternative could just snap into existence overnight like that. 
Yada, 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 you get the point. So this is, this, you might have seen this as copy pasta. It's, people post it all the time. But it actually illustrates something that people actually think. That is, people hear about Linux, they hear about this, oh, people write code for no particular reason because they're not making that much money on it, right? Like, you need some kind of enormous company to, to build top-down this operating system. And it's, it's sort of, pe people think of Linux as being a kind of miracle. Um, but my argument uh, more generally is that Linux isn't really a, a miracle. It's something that, again, falls out from these decentralized, the fact that it's so decentralized gradually building up into a larger uh, structure. Um, now, I, as I said at the beginning, I think that Linux is just sort of, um, you know, there are many examples of this. I think we're moving to a point where, uh, you know, I, I as an academic, we're getting to a point where um, people are starting to realize that the core of things isn't just planned systems. It's things that are sort of built uh, bottom up. Uh, so traditionally, we've had this idea that, well, something is rational if we sit down in a corporate boardroom and we plan it. And we say, oh, this is what this is going to do in the operating system. This is what this is going to do, you know, maybe in some socio-political affair or something like that. And this is an idea that people have because it appeals to your sense of logic and it makes sense to people. Uh, but the reality is, and the, the reality that I think Linux de demonstrates very strongly, is that uh, it's really a very small, uh, the reality is the world is a bunch of very small and decentralized systems that sort of play into each other. Um, so this has actually sort of become a meme, um, decentralization. As I said, it sounds like a TED talk at the beginning. Uh, so that's, you know, one of the reasons I, I feel weird about it. But uh, this, uh, actually, this guy's sort of a meme on my chair. Yes? Just really quickly, just to piggyback on what you said about sitting down in the boardroom and saying this is kind of what should be done. Yeah. You know, it seems like a lot of what we use today that was pioneered by Zero Drops Park or whoever back in the day, there's no practical application for it. Right. Nobody wanted to, you know, hear about it. Right. But it was probably created by people that were, you know, experimenting or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. You know, for not not necessarily a monetary thing. Right. Right. Yeah. That and that's my point. Actually, a perfect slide. Uh, so this, I don't know. You guys know Nassim Taleb. He's a meme on my channel. Which I, yeah, he's a great guy. Um, so well, one of the things that actually he talks about is how scientific discovery is isn't an issue of sitting down and planning. We're going to discover this tomorrow. It's an issue of just sort of messing around, messing around, you know, if you're a chemist, sometimes you just play around with chemicals and you, you tinker a little and you find something great. Um, and uh, I, I totally recommend this guy, by the way, if you, you should read Anti-Fragile. Uh, but, but the, actually, I'll go ahead and uh, spoil the book for you uh, because it's relevant to the talk. Um, so one of the, the concepts that Nassim Taleb, and he's part of this more general, I guess, intellectual movement to um, decentralization, one of the concepts he coins is what's called anti-fragility. That is, you know, something is fragile if, if you expose it to, to sort of stress and it breaks. Whereas something is anti-fragile if you expose it to stress or something dangerous and it actually gets better. And there's a sense in which Linux is exactly like that. Um, in the sense that, like, it's nice to have a bunch of little programs and it's nice, one of the best things about Linux is that it's buggy. There are programs that mess up, bugs happen, they happen all the time because there are so many moving parts. And the great thing about bugs is uh, you can, especially in an environment where everything is decentralized, is you can deal with them at a very local level. They cause local damage, the world doesn't collapse, you know, your entire operating system doesn't collapse or something like that where you have a bug. Um, and when, when someone complains about Linux being buggy, I think that's a good thing. Uh, because effectively what it shows is all the problems in coding that are happening in Linux are visible and we can deal with them. Whereas if we deal with like a, a operating system that is closed source and not necessarily visible to us, that's something that, you know, is, uh, you know, it, it doesn't work that way. It's more dangerous because when the problems actually show up, they're catastrophic. Um, uh, oh yeah, uh, that's sort of just what I said. Um, so anyway, so this is something that defines so software, it defines, uh, you know, a lot of social affairs and it defines how we, even how we model things scientifically. Um, so again, in, in my field, this is Jerry Fodor, I don't know if you're familiar with him, he wrote uh, The Modularity of Miles, no, <laughs> um, he wrote The Modularity of Mine, actually, who knows Jerry Fodor? Oh, not as many people as I thought. I thought he was like a household name, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I guess, okay. Yeah, m my house. We all of us know know about. It. Okay, so um, Jerry Fodor is a, is sort of a philosopher. Uh, he's actually recently, recently late 
what, what, he died recently, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, so um, yeah, one of his ideas is effectively the mind is modular. That is, it's not one big unit, it's actually a bunch of subunits and stuff like that. Uh, but one of the nice things about this is this is sort of a decentralized idea, but it's now come under fire by people who are even more extremely decentralized. Um, that is, nowadays, you know, you have the rise of what's called PDP or connectionism that's parallel distributed processing. Uh, and the idea behind it is, you know, this is like neural nets kind of stuff. And it, the idea uh, that has to do with it in sort of cognitive science um, is that basically we don't so much even have modules, but the, the level of, uh, you know, the level relevant uh, in even neurology is lower. That is really what you have is small neuronal elements that interact with each other in very complex ways. And the architecture of the mind is so decentralized and distributed, you don't even have modules. You have something even more, even more diffuse. Um, and one of the reasons, for example, if you knock your head against the wall or something, uh, and you don't immediately die is because your brain, in a sense, it isn't necessarily anti-fragile, but it, there's a lot of redundancy in it. If you uh, lose part of your brain having a stroke or having severe damage, it can recover and stuff like that. Um, and this is actually the, you know, is the field more generally of cognitive science is sort of, sort of moving in this direction. Uh, even though, you know, all my advisors and stuff like that don't like it, but it's sort of because they're old and they're, you know, they, they call everything they don't like behaviorism, but it's, you know, whatever. Uh, Skinner didn't do anything wrong. Um, so neural nets, uh, so the other thing, actually this is relevant to my work, so this uh, is in my mind because we went over it in a seminar um, recently, but uh, you know, one of the things about a lot of scientific modeling, again, I'm a, I'm a formal linguist, uh, is that there are a lot of domains in cognition that aren't even mod like modelable without highly decentralized net networks. Um, so something, one of the things I work in is uh, how the prosody of language actually affects things like word order uh, or the syntactic categories of language or something like that. Um, this actually is a, an article that argues that really, um, um, I would go into it more, but I, I don't know how much time we're going to have, um, that really the, the nature of language is such that you need some decentralized, because uh, so many of the modules of the brain are looking at each other, they're recursively defined, you can't necessarily model something without a kind of neural net or a highly decentralized network. Um, that's a, not a neural net, that's a neural net. Um, so anyway, um, so anyway, the, the idea behind this is really the brain obeys the Unix philosophy, not just the brain, but a lot of things functioning in society in more or less obey the Unix philosophy in the sense that they do one thing, they do them well, and a lot of the aggregate features we observe in the world, they're not designed, uh, they come sort of, they're emergent properties of, you know, the, the, the smaller features. Um, what was I going to, oh. I already talked about this. Anyway, that's a syntax. Oh, well, one other aspect I should talk about. So this is a syntax tree in linguistics. We do those all the time. They're all fake. They're not really real. But one of the things that people notice about the structure of language um, is, uh, you know, uh, even though verbs, if you think of verbs as being like functions, you know, some verbs seem to have multiple arguments, uh, stuff like that. Um, but uh, one of the findings of linguistics generally is that languages are usually very uh, decentralized. They're basically binary in their structure. Like if you draw a sentence out, they're basically uh, as decentralized as possible with as many uh, nodes. Uh, and this, act this actually, uh, we're coming full circu circle because uh, as I mentioned at the, the, the beginning of the talk, um, there is, um, during the 20th century uh, with Herbert Simon and a lot of other people who worked on cybernetics, there was the idea that, um, you know, uh, of, you know, the watchmakers, or watchmakers paradox, uh, yeah, the watchmakers parable, uh, where decentralized systems, as you construct them, are actually a lot more efficient. They can survive stressors better. Uh, they can survive, they're more future-proof. That's another TED Talk word. Um, but in general, that, that's the idea behind it. And this is, I only put this book up because Jeff Sampson, who's an interesting guy, uh, noted this as language as well. Um, so anyway, I think, um, yeah, anyway, I, I think we're wrapping up at this point. So my, my point generally is people in free software, people in Linux, they shouldn't shy away from the minimal, the things that have bugs, the things that are hard to understand for introductory users. And I think people should focus more on making things accessible. That is making things accessible to new users and not, not by like throwing more bloat on top to make sense of it, you know, to make, you know, give sort of a familiar environment to it, uh, but giving people the tools they need to navigate uh, the, the sort of Linux world. So my TED Talk takeaways, 
our um, overcomplicate design, that should be a D at the end, overcomplicated design, uh, overcom okay, that, that's not even a sentence, forget about it. Um, <laughs> Uh, Overcomplicated design is bad, and small is beautiful. Um, that is, if you can't break it, you can't improve it. That is, if you can't find bugs in something, you can't improve it. And it's great to have bugs that are at a small level than are at a larger level. And make the learning curve easier. Make it give people tutorials, give people wizards, make the you know make the life easy for them. But don't get rid of learning curves because that is just sort of paving over the problem. It's you know uh, exporting it for later on. Um, so that I think I think the next slide is conclu. Oh yeah, that's it. So that's my contact information, uh, and I guess that that's about it. If you guys want to do questions or something, so yeah. Uh -oh. Well, I mean, I've, I've realized through your talk you kept referring to Linux as like this whole system. Right. And I mean, I would say that like Richard Solomon. Oh uh, yeah. You know, would like, disagree with you completely. Well, I think everyone. So, you know, it's like, Well, it's even big. It's even bigger than that. It's even. I, well, yeah, exactly. That's why I tried to hedge my bet. And it's not even GNU Linux. It's greater than that. When I'm talking about it, I'm talking about like all these programs that. I mean, the entire environment of development. I think everyone understands. If I use Lin if I say Linux, most people sort of understand. Ah, yeah. But yeah, I'm not talking about the kernel, and I'm not talking about even GNU Linux. I'm talking about something more general. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's like. Like what he's more talking about is kind of like you know semantics a little bit like this or this or that, but um, you know it's, it, it's like it's like the, the concept of, of computers in general. Like you know, there's this thing where like in in, in education, it's a broad statement. You know, people say, well, certain people may not have access to stuff, and they don't have money, they don't have the best computers, they don't have iPads and stuff like this. But you know, a lot of people in this room they know that. You know, like you said, there's a lot of powerful utilities and things like Rev and things like that that have been here for a long time and are going to continue to be here. And, you know, just because you can, you know, work a program, a, a tool or product, per se, um, doesn't necessarily make you smarter, especially when they change it later. Yeah. So, you know, there's apps and there's kids that can use apps and things like that. But I, I, I see value in, in teaching uh people, you know, poor stuff, You're right. you know, right. if, it, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, yeah, it does make sense. In fact, I, um, one of the things about Linux, so I don't necessarily think Linux is going to become, you know, the number one OS anytime soon, but I, I think there's a sense in which we can say that Linux will outlast both Microsoft and uh, Apple. And the reason I say that is because both of those are just centralized authorities that are tied to particular companies. And it, who knows what happens in the next, maybe next month, maybe next 100 years, uh, but those two are eventually going to pass away. But something, a distributed system like Linux or something like that, uh, or, you know, whatever you want to call it, the GNU slash Linux general environment or something like that, that's something that's going to be around. So for that exactly exact reason why you say it, um, that's something that's going to be, I mean, it's valuable learning stuff like that. Well, it's the case, you know, Apple went back and used their derivative units. Yeah. You know, it's right. not like they kind of Right, right, yeah. So, yes? Um, so, one of the things that Taleb points out in his books is that you're better off having a bunch of fanatics than you are having just right. passive participants in right. whatever you have. So, Linux has that and contributes more to this. Right. Um, right, no, that, that's actually entirely correct. I mean, um, so take, take, take the most extreme like FSF positions on everything. Um, I don't necessarily agree with them, but I like that they're there. I like that there are people who will throw a fit whenever they you know, have to use something proprietary. That's a good thing. We might think that's weird, but that's something that's a good thing for everyone. Because if most of us are going to be sort of ambivalent to if they use you know, free software or you know, proprietary software, um, if we're ambivalent to those, Obviously, the powers that be or the, the, the corporations that have a motive in it sort of want to nudge us every little bit to proprietary software. So, I th yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, yeah? Well, in Linux, like in Windows, when Windows 8 came out, it broke Windows. Windows was broken. <laughs> yeah. And everybody was mad about it. Nobody, you know, it really, there was only one version of Windows, and it was broken. Right. And 
in Linux, like if Ubuntu puts out a bad version, it doesn't break Linux. Exactly. And that's a big thing people miss about that. I remember, right. you remember back in the day, people were calling for, we should have one desktop. Oh, yeah. We have one desktop, everybody come to us. Well, that doesn't work for everything. Like yeah. you have an old laptop, you want to run open box and something else, maybe you want you run something else. And, Linux is good the way it is. Right, right, yeah. I just, I'm going to repeat that for the microphone because that's a good point. Yeah, so his point was, you know, it's a lot of people have said that, uh, you know, oh, we should just have one distribution, one, you know, uh, desktop environment or something like, like that. But, yeah, you're, it's having all your eggs in one basket, right? It's it's not very conducive for long, the long term when things mess up in them. Uh, Unity. Unity came out. Not, not everybody liked that. Right. People just moved over to Tudor or moved right. over to Right, it's nice having that optionality, right. You could almost kind of make an argument or kind of say like Linux is, is not like this thing per se, it's more like a state of, a state of mind kind of thing. Right. But that's all another conversation. Yeah, well, the way I put it, my subscribers always make fun of me for saying this on YouTube, but yeah, Linux is sort of a social construct. It's not really, there's not really one essence of Linux. There are just many different working parts, and you put them together, and eh, it looks like a Linux, so that's what it is. Um, yeah, well, the technical definition, you know. <laughs> Any other? Yeah, you never know, but uh, but but the important like even when Linus is gone and the kernel, you know who knows what happens to the kernel. The system in general still survives, right? It's easy enough to. There are other kernels out there, and yeah. But you know, just to go to your point, you know, was the talk yesterday um, on Windows subsystem for Linux and just how much, and not just the speaker, but people in the room were tossing around in terms of downloading Linux distributions to run on Windows, and that is everything except the kernel, and we still call right. It. Right. Yeah. And I, I also feel, yeah, and I think, I mean, one other example is like, so Android is Linux. But is it really? I mean, it, it has the kernel, but uh, it doesn't really feel like the same thing. You know, I, the, the, the term is... Well, okay, yeah. Well, yeah, but I'm, I'm just saying, in the sense of Linux that I've been using it here, it doesn't really... Yes, I know that it's technically Linux, but it, it feels... Feels wrong. Yeah. The opposite example is the BSD Unixes. Right. They're, they don't use the Linux kernel, but they're very Linux like. Yeah, exactly. Linux is very Unix like. Yeah. yeah, I think we just need a word for that. I don't. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, well, I, I should say the. Uh, I guess the title of the talk should be, you know, the Unix environment is the Wild West or something like that. Yeah. All right. Any, any other <laughs> questions or <laughs> just rumblings? All right. I, I guess that's it. Well, it was nice talking to you guys. Yeah.